Hi, I'm Colin Morgan, executive producer of Built to Sell Radio. And if you've been enjoying this podcast, you're going to absolutely love our new newsletter, Built to Sell News. We share actionable tips and insights to help you get inside the mind of an acquirer and punch above your weight when it comes time to exit. To subscribe, simply head over to builttosell.com slash subscribe to sign up for free today. Jordan Dubin, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Thanks, John. I got to say, I, uh, I'm excited to be on, but I feel like I was set up to fail a little bit because <laughs> it's very hard to follow Carrie Kelsch in anything. And I feel like this is part two of her interview. So uh, I'm a little worried that I'm going to let everyone down, but thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great. And Carrie was one of our favorite guests. And if you haven't listened to that episode, you should go back and listen to it. It's about A Plus Garage Doors, how she built it into an incredible Utah-based success story, an amazing outcome. And and you bought her business. So we wanted to have you on and, and to find out uh, sort of how you think about uh, acquiring and partnering with home service companies, of which we have lots of our listeners. And I think our approach uh, right now is to talk about private equity groups and investors who are going about rolling up industries because it's happening in virtually every industry, whether it's veterinarian clinics, advertising agencies, home service companies, there are investment theses out there that are saying, okay, we can roll these things up and, 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 and make some money on the, on the journey. And so we're excited to talk to you because you've got a, a play with garage doors. Um, so we'll talk about that before we go there. I, I just love to just kind of get to, a sense of how you got to Guild. Um, mm-hmm. Take me back to Harvard, uh, where you know, like I, I'd love to just go through the education and then the internships at Goldman Sachs. Like, walk me through that because it's a pretty un, unusual path to garage doors. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, not not taking anything away from my time at Harvard, uh, internship at Goldman Sachs, working at Goldman Sachs, I think where the idea really started uh, was when myself and my two partners, the two co-founders of Guild, uh, Joe Delaney and Sean Slazik, when we were working at L. Catterton. L. Catterton is a upper middle market consumer focused private equity firm. And we met first day on the job. You know, Joe and Sean are, are two years older than me. I'm 27. They're 29. Um, but we met as first year associates at the ripe age of, I think I was 23 or 24, and, and they were 25, 26, uh, and became fast friends. Um, and I think beyond just being friends, trusting each other, you know, I, I really thought the world of those two guys. And when I, couldn't solve an issue when I had problems, I would go to them. Uh, and so not to go kind of too much into it of why the partnership works so well, but I think that when we were leaving Catterton, when we were deciding to start this venture, while of course it was risky, while of course we were worried, I felt so much comfort because I knew if I was in the boat, if I was in the foxhole with Sean and Joe, um, I had two of the best friends and two of the greatest minds on my team. But, you know, the the two and a half, three years we spent at El Catterton, this is kind of all we did. This being buy and build investing, roll up investing. Uh, Catterton wasn't starting platforms from scratch like we did with Guild, but they were the ones who would receive a SIM from a large investment bank when the platform hit 20 million of EBITDA or 25 million of EBITDA or 30 million of EBITDA. So they were kind of the first buyer or even sometimes the second buyer. Um, And so there, where they were in the life cycle of a consolidation play is, again, they weren't the ones incubating it, starting it from zero, but they were the ones taking it from 30 million of EBITDA to 60 or 70 million of EBITDA when it once again, for the most part, would sell to a larger private equity firm. Um, and I think, you know, we'll talk a lot about it on the call, but I think one of the reasons roll-ups across every category, but especially residential and commercial services, remains a viable investment approach uh, and a really attractive one at that is even when you take a business from 30 to 75 million of EBITDA, there's still so much white space in this category. You know, you professionalize the operation, you continue uh, to supercharge organic growth, but the ability to continue this m a playbook and continue to have add-on acquisitions at lower implied multiples to what you're paying for the platform as a whole, 
that gives investors, not like myself, not the ones who start from scratch, but the private equity buyers in boardrooms, uh, that gives them so much comfort in paying these premium multiples because they know the opportunity to continue the M and A buying spree will always be there in these highly fragmented, large total addressable markets. Okay, so walk me through. Walk yeah, that was a lot. That was a lot. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I, I appreciate the the background for sure. Walk me through the business model uh, that you have at Guild because so you and and Joe and Sean is it that you you started Guild? Yep, we're the three co-founders, equal partners. Okay, so you guys are equal partners. And and the structure, is it a, I've heard uh, these things referred to as GPs where you get uh, LP, limited partners to invest. Like what's the legal structure? Uh, And maybe walk me through that. Yeah. You know, I think there's there's a lot of terminology. There's a lot of ways uh, to phrase it. I think kind of to start from a macro level, when we left Catterton, our goal, our objective was never to create a fund, create a private equity firm. We wanted to create a company. You know, we thought about Guild no different than a tech entrepreneur thinks about a startup they're creating. Just because we were going to um, an industry that has been around for decades, and just because we were using M and A as one part of the value creation uh, thesis, doesn't mean it can't be a startup the same way a, a software app can be a startup or a social media platform can be. So. For us, we went into it hyper focused on, hey, this is not going to be the start of, you know, hidden harbor capital partners, and this is investment number one. We were focusing on one company, and we were going to be direct employees of that company, and that holds true to this day. You know, we are the co-founders, but we're also employees. And now that we've brought on an unbelievable CEO and Tim, in many ways we report to Tim. And so, what I love about what we do is we're intimately involved in the weeds and it's all hands on deck, especially with how fast we've scaled. So you'll find Joe, Sean, and myself playing four different roles on any given day. And that makes it fun. Stressful sometimes, don't get me wrong, but fun. So well, how did you guys get the money to start it though? Because yeah. you were all relatively early in your career. We were, uh, we were. So we raised about $35 million from I think it was 10 or 12 uh, individual investors. Some of them- 35, being- okay, so they're gonna, I got a first plus. How does a 27 year old with no industry experience raise 35 million bucks? That's crazy. I Believe me, it's, it's not lost on me. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, and I'll have you know, John and, and all the listeners that we went in uh, with the goal of 15 max, max 20. Uh, and I think all of us thought, wow, we're going to have to have 50 investors. We might have to do a, a, a GoFundMe for the last you know, 3 million bucks. Um, but what it kind of taught all three of us, which I firmly believe in, and I encourage um, you know, anybody who's listening, who's thinking of doing something similar to really internalize is uh, there is too much money in this world and not enough good investment opportunities. And so I fundamentally believe if you approach an investor or a group of investors with a thoughtful investment thesis, a built out pipeline and a 60, 90, 100 day plan. And so it's not just, hey, I like this category. I think we can do it. But you lay it out and have everything in place minus the capital. I think you will always be able to raise ample capital. And so the pitch was the following. Um, private equity continues to love residential services. The reason being massive total addressable market as you kind of narrow down across all the sub segments. HVAC plumbing and electrical has gotten the most attention over the last three to four years. Every single private equity firm, it seems like is piling into the category and PE backed platforms in the space are growing massively. Um, What is the next frontier in residential services. What's a category that hasn't been consolidated already, that doesn't have 10 P back platforms or 15 P back platforms um, that we can go and be in a uh, prime position to go consolidate. Now, it sounds very simple uh, and you can kind of go down the list of categories. Hey, there's no P in this. There's, 
But what you have to ask yourself and you have to be thoughtful about is, why is there no private equity activity in this category? And I think sometimes you'll find that the total addressable market is too small, or there isn't true industrial logic that supports consolidation. So in other words- what's industrial logic mean? What does that mean? it, It basically means, is this industry meant to be consolidated? Are three companies under one umbrella more profitable and stronger than on their own? And there are certainly categories that that isn't the case. And there are others like the garage door industry, like HVAC, plumbing, and electrical, where you can point to all the reasons that a collection of companies with integrated back office functions and a unified front are so much stronger than a standalone mom and pop. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and we had Adam Coffey, the guy behind the, the, uh, the private equity playbook on the show a while ago. And Adam talked about the thesis that private equity uses when they do a rollout. So part of it is uh, multiple expansion. They're looking for, you know, buy low, sell high kind of idea. Part of it is operational efficiency. So bringing, you know, next level Harvard thinking to an industry that may be a little bit antiquated, as well as the cost saving associated with consolidating things like the back office. There's also a fourth sort of revenue stream that comes from, in the case of a GPLP sort of structure, just getting kind of a bit of revenue off the top with a a management fee. to kind of manage the investments. I realize that's not the structure that you guys have. So in yeah. the three multiple expansion, sort of operational efficiency, um, and just getting better at running a garage door company, how did you think about and stack rank those three sort of value drivers in the thesis? Yeah, you know, I'll talk to that. And I think it actually ties nicely into the overall thesis uh, of why garage. but. You know, of those three, um, I'll be the first one to kind of raise my hand and say, as the person with a Harvard degree in the room, uh, I I do not do a good job of helping with the operational efficiencies. And so what I would challenge everybody out there who uh, has a similar idea and is kind of uh, earmarking, hey, we're going to grow because we're smarter than the owners and we're going to come in and we have such great ideas. It's naive to think that way. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've been so amazed with is the level of sophistication of these mom and pop businesses we partner with. It almost feels unfair to call them a mom and pop business. And not once have I been able to come in and help with operational efficiencies. In fact, you know, whether it's Carrie Kelsch or Jake Wald or Jeff Sanford or Travis Trentham, they're the ones teaching me. And so on the operational side, I think it's important to be very self-aware and say, hey, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And, and Jordan Dubin does not know operational efficiencies in a garage door business. And so that's not to say, you know, part of our value creation thesis isn't tied to organic growth. And we want to both grow the top line and see where there's room for margin improvement. But that's where you have to supplement yourself with an awesome executive team. People who come from the residential or commercial services industry who have seen this playbook done and who have played the kind of boots on the ground uh, frontline role. So, so I, I would start by that, saying that. Um, definitely multiple arbitrage. Um, I think that you see that in most categories, um, but it's especially true in the garage door industry because of the scarcity value of scaled assets. Um, and- Let's just encourage some of that. So multiple arbitrage for our listeners would be you know, buying a business for, I'm just going to make up numbers, five times EBITDA and hoping to sell it on the back end after the whole platform has grown substantially to for 10 times EBITDA. I mean, that's just, I'm just using those numbers as round, but the, the, the arbitrage associated with that, a lift in in multiple, uh, obviously bigger companies are attracting bigger multiples. They're rare, more scarce, as Jordan's saying. So that's multiple expansion and the yeah. arbitrage associated with it. Am I getting that roughly right? Exactly. No, I I mean, there are nuances, of course, but the general idea, you hit the nail on the head. Um, But I think where you see a lot of our ability to put our thumb on the scale, and when I say our, I mean myself, Joe, and Sean, um, is with the cost savings on the procurement side. Partnering with best-in-class manufacturers, partnering with different vendors in the ecosystem, whether it's software providers, insurance providers, 
fleet management. Um, and then, of course, you know, the cost of the doors, the cost of the motors, um, down to the cost of, you know, the uniforms that the employees wear at each individual brand. What you can do is, hey, you're no longer kind of having the purchasing power and firepower of a $10 million revenue business or a $5 million revenue business. You know, you now wear the guild shield. You now have the guild cape. And so when you go and you buy inventory, when you go uh, and you're negotiating best in class leasing rates for your fleet, um, you are viewed in the eyes of that counterparty as a $200 million plus company. Um, and, and that's something that we've immediately been able to benefit from forming these strategic partnerships with people in the ecosystem. And I think what gets me excited and all the other owners excited is that should only continue to grow as we grow. Um, and I think it's, it's easy to view it in a cynical way and say, hey, you're just trying to beat down the, these other people in the ecosystem, the suppliers, the, the vendors, the software providers. But really, you know, the, the pitch has been, and they've been very welcoming to it, is we're coming in and we're helping to grow an industry. Uh, and a rising tide lifts all boats. And so not only do we think each of our individual partner companies will have outsized growth uh, in the next five years versus what they had in the last five years, which will benefit everybody, but also the rest of the industry. And of course, the consumers we serve. Um, so you know, for all those reasons, um, it's super beneficial. Um, so now kind of taking it back to the thesis, and I'll, I'll try to make this quick. So we were looking for the next frontier. You know, what subcategory hadn't been consolidated as much as HVAC, wasn't as saturated as HVAC, um, but yet still had a 10 plus billion dollar total addressable market and had at least one precedent transaction that we could point to partially to have a watermark for, hey, this is what we think a scaled platform trades for. But also, hey, here's what a, a scale, here's what a best in class scaled platform looks like. You know, here's the blueprint. Um, you know, it's great and all to be a first mover, but the second mover is able to learn from the first mover's mistakes. Yeah, so I love awesome. being the second mover, which is what Guild is. And so we so just own uh, A1 Garage Doors. Uh, it was, it's an awesome business. Founded by Tommy Mello and acquired by Cortec in 2022. Cortec is a trade for <laughs> trade for 21 times EBITDA. Wow! Yeah, it's a big number. Incredibly large number, because um, of scarcity value. At the time, there were no scale platforms, and and to be clear, A1 is a best in class company. Um, their their organic growth is off the charts. So, it, I personally believe that valuation was wholeheartedly deserved. Um, but I think that if you know it was an HVAC, might not get the same robust premium multiple, just because a private equity firm could say, "Look, I don't feel comfortable paying twenty plus times. I'll wait for the next platform to come across and see if I can get it for eighteen. There was no next platform in Garage at the time. If you wanted exposure to this industry, which was so goddamn attractive, and I'll get into that in a second, you had to own this asset. And so, like anything in capitalism, supply and demand. You know, the, the demand was through the roof, the supply was one. Uh, and it created the perfect dynamic uh, to have a platform trade for a super premium multiple. And, and what are you buying these companies for? I can't remember what the multiple was in the case of Kerry, but I. I like single digits, right? Like what would the typical range be? Single digits. So Carrie's Car company traded for 10 times, but Carrie Car was at seven and a half million of EBITDA, which, and I, I feel like I, I've studied this industry. I've dedicated my life to this industry for the last year and a half. Um, I'm yet to see a standalone business with more than three and a half million of EBITDA. Um, so it goes A plus at seven and a half, and then the next largest is three and a half. Um, I think you know, what we see is above a, a million of EBITDA, anywhere between one to three million of EBITDA, probably somewhere between, you know, six to seven and a half times, six to seven times. And anything below 
a million of EBITDA would probably be four to five times. <laughs> Got it. So part of the strategy here is to buy assets. Uh, if I can under, like, summarize the, the thesis, buy assets uh, for somewhere between five and 10 times EBITDA. Uh, take advantage of economies of scale because bigger you know, companies get better deals on everything from software to uniforms. Hire some real operational experts within Guild who understand the garage door industry and can bring some best practices to the table. And then ultimately, one day down the road, become the next 21 times EBITDA exit uh, and everybody wins. Is, am I getting that kind of broadly right? Broadly, yeah. I mean, there are obviously a lot of nuances. Uh, sure. But broadly, that's exactly it. Um, what I think is so interesting about this category, and again, this takes us back to the thesis, is you know, once we identified the garage, so we identified what we wanted in an industry. And now you've got to see if that even exists. Um, because you know, what I always say is um, you can't take an academic approach to this style of investing. It's all great and good to make a spreadsheet and, and write in a notebook. You know, we want businesses with 95% free cash flow conversion with no key man risk, and we want to buy them for less than four times, and we want to get six times leverage. Because when I put this into my Excel model, then I make three times my money. You know, where I think people are successful in building these platforms and rollups is, is the people who are willing to be scrappy and look outside of the spreadsheets. People who are able to look past, to a certain degree, the upfront numbers and be able to distill very quickly, is this a leader I want to back? Is this someone who has a great grip on their business and the industry? And is this business with our help going to become supremely successful over the next four or five years? And so, so that's, that's a side note. Um, when we had the criteria for the industry, we almost accidentally stumbled upon the garage door industry because we were looking across all the sub verticals and residential services, you know, roofing, siding, windows, gutter repair, pool. And the more we learned about garage when we discovered it, it was like turning a page. And with each page you turn, the more excited you got. You know, it was a $14 billion residential total addressable market, massive check. It was 92% fragmented, massive check. It was, gonna, it was set to grow 7 to 8% over the next five years versus 3 to 4% for HVAC, massive check. Um, there was a precedent transaction in the space at that time, six months earlier, that traded for 21 times, massive check. And, and so you, <laughs> you get all excited and, and you have to start asking yourself, what am I missing? Yeah. You know, nothing's ever easy. We're, the first thing myself, Joe, and Sean will tell you is we never claim to be the smartest people in the room. I think actually, if anything, we don't give ourselves enough credit and we always assume we're wrong. Um, but you know, we're certainly no smarter than any private equity firm uh, that had a similar thesis and plenty did. So, so why were they not able to be successful? Uh, and why do we think we're going to be the ones to be able to capitalize here. And, you know, what we would later discuss. So the only way to answer that question is to burn the ships, to commit to it and try to make it work and remove yourself from the academic part of the exercise and get on a fucking plane, sit in the middle seat of row 35 and go meet with as many owners as you can over the next three months. And that's exactly what we did. Um, I want to pause. Sorry, am I not to curse? Is that why you're pausing? No, no, not at all. You can curse all you want. Uh, we'll just put a disclaimer on it. But I want to pause you there because there's something that that I find really fascinating, and I, I'd love to to dive deeper. Um, as I do with all my guests, I I look you up on LinkedIn, and what I saw was arguably the most polished resume I've ever seen. So, like for my listeners who haven't gone through LinkedIn, I'll walk you through it. So Harvard undergrad, Harvard MBA, Goldman Sachs 
internship during his MBA and then Goldman Sachs out of his MBA into L. Catterton Private Equity. Like you couldn't describe a more polished resume than you have. Like it's literally like you put it up on a wall and go, imagine this guy's the next captain of the universe. What I find fascinating is talking to you, and in particular talking to Carrie as well, prior to you, she describes you as a very down-to-earth guy, willing to stride in the, in the airplane in the middle seat. Um, and it's such a contradiction for me, right? I, I would have expected and came into this meeting expecting a very polished sort of talking from the textbook kind of guy. That's not what I'm getting. Is I'm getting a different vibe from you. And I find that fascinating and I want to explore more. Where does that come from? Because someone with, with your resume usually doesn't ride in the middle seat and is willing to kind of get scrappy. So where's that coming from? Tell me about your background. Where do you think that comes from? Um, not Harvard and Goldman Sachs as far as I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, well, I, I appreciate the kind words. Um, you know, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that, of course... Don't answer it in a polished way. Answer I, it in I, a real way. Like, tell me who Jordan is. Like, what, what were your folks like? What did you grow up like? There's something that you got from somebody along the way that is serving you well right now. So, I think there are a couple things. Um, you know, I grew up idolizing my father. My dad, he was successful in the finance world, um, completely different side of the finance world, public markets, investing. Uh, he worked for a hedge fund for a number of years. Um, but you know, from the earliest age, I, I grew up watching him on the phone. I used to go into the office you know, as young as four years old, five years old, just to sit in his office and watch him just because I, I wanted to be with him 24 seven. And he, I mean, he was my hero. Uh, and he still is, he still is. And I, I, you know, his background was so different from mine. You know, I'll use your words, John, not my words. If I have the most polished background, he had the least polished background. Um, you know, he went to SUNY Stony Brook State School of, of Stony Brook. Um, played football there. Football was the only reason he even got into college. Uh, his father drove a taxi cab. His mother didn't work. Um, leaves Stony Brook, graduates after three years, leaves Stony Brook and wanted to be a stockbroker. And at the time, there were 32 firms interviewed at all 32 and got rejected from 31 of the 32 and managed to get the 32nd, literally the 32nd job. Um, and then went on to have a great career. So, you know, while I had, while I was fortunate enough to be able to go to great schools and get great jobs, I think that I always saw myself and my dad, uh, and I always wanted to have the same work ethic and embody the same ideals that my father had and has. Um, and so. While, of course, I was always thankful and, and uh, aware of the privileges I had being able to attend a school like Harvard, for me, you know, I, I always thought of myself as, hey, if I don't work harder than 99.9% .9 of the people here, I, I'm not going to be allowed back next year. Uh, and that was always my mindset. Um, so I think, I think that's part one. Um, Part two is, you know, I think I'm an extroverted person uh, and I care deeply about other people. Uh, I don't know what the term for this is, but I'm one of those people who gets more uh, enjoyment and happiness in kind of seeing someone else happy based off of giving someone something or doing something for someone than I could ever get doing something for myself. Um, and so why I, one of the many reasons I love what I do uh, with Guild is I've made so many friends along the way in the last year and a half. And I, and I truly mean friends, you know, Terry, Jeff Sanford, Jake Wald, Chris Chapman, like th these aren't partners, colleagues, they're lifelong friends. 
you know, I, I think of the, what is it, 15 guild owners, eight of them have their kids call me Uncle Jordan. And, and you know, I text with four of the owner's kids. I text with every owner, but I text with four of the owner's kids because I love it. And so, you know, part of it is the, is the hard work, you know, wake up early, um, you know, the secrets in the dirt, have grit. But another part of it is I love what I do. And I'm happy to get on a 6 a.m. flight three to four days a week because I love going to visit these people. I love working with them. I, I love building something together. Um, and so, sure, I think it's, it's partially a work ethic. You can't have the work ethic um, and, and do this type of job. But another part of it is just genuine passion and love for what we do. Um, feeling excited about visiting, meeting with new owners, um, and, and building something as a group. Um, well, let's talk, so, yeah. about, let's talk about it because I want to hear about the economics. So when you go and buy a business, the private equity playbook that Adam Coffey talked about is, is that you buy a majority stake in the business, you ask the owner to reinvest effectively role equity, a portion of it, they become a minority investment with the view that over time, that minority stake, if all goes well, could end up being worth more than the original tranche. Um, how is your model similar or different than the kind of classic private equity model? Yeah, so what we do is we come in and we take a majority stake in an owner's business for cash. So you have an initial liquidity event for anywhere between, call it 65 to 85% of your business. We are not in the business of buying 100% of businesses because we partner with owners and we rely so much on the leadership at the localized brand level um, that it's critical for us, for them to have skin in the game. Not just to have alignment of interests, but if we're going to benefit from that juicy second bite of the apple, we want them to as well. Um, and I think that's what's one of the things that's made our model so successful is, you know, we have the most incentivized local leadership you can have because it's the existing owners who have so much institutional knowledge about their market, about their business, about the industry as a whole. And they're equally as incentivized as anybody because we're all shoulder to shoulder co-owners of this thing. And so, you know, where I see private equity, and, and I don't mean to generalize, but where I see private equity sometimes go wrong is take the approach, hey, buy 100% of these businesses and deploy a regional GM who just graduated from a Harvard Business School and, and have him run the show. Um, that's not our model. Have I seen it work? Yes. Have I seen it go wrong? Yes. Um, but that's not our model. Our model is predicated on partnership. So we take the majority stake. Then the owners continue to own that remaining, call it 35 to minimum and hard minimum 15%. They continue to earn their W-2 salary. You know, there's no downsizing. Um, but they also get 35 to 15%, depending on their pro rata share of the excess cash flows quarterly. And this is another big thing that we love is you no longer have to feel like you're quote unquote cash poor as an owner. You know, the, the benefit of the entrepreneurial journey, if you're doing it correctly, is the ability to draw cash flows in excess of your W-2 salary. I mean, that flexibility, that financial flexibility is what draws so many owners to owning their own business and running their own business. We don't take that away from them. You know, they continue to get their pro rata share. So say it's a 65-35 partnership or 70-30 partnership, you know, they get 30% of their excess cash flow quarterly, hitting their pocket, in addition to their W-2 salary. And why we think that's such an awesome way to structure it is, you know, one, continuing to let the entrepreneurs get that entrepreneurial feel of excess cash flow, which is so at the core of what it's like running your own business. But two, when times are tough, you feel it in your wallet. You have less dollars hitting your pocket. It isn't a binary you know, 150K salary. It's, hey, $100,000 less in excess cash flow. Like, I got I to get on top of this. 
I got to I got to meet with my team. And so we like that model for a number of reasons. Um, so continue to earn that. Then at the time of an exit, these owners who own a minority share in their business, they get the business level platform multiple of Guild, you know, whatever it is, multiplied by their EBITDA and then their ownership percentage, whether it be 15, 20, 25, 30%. Or 35%. Again, why we like that model is you directly eat what you kill. And you don't feel like you're going into a black box where you're relying on the performance of 15 other owners on the other side of the country. You directly control your PL and know whatever you have over the next several years, that's what you're going to get. On a, on a super rich multiple compared to what you would get as a standalone business. So um, I think that that's, that's the most basic way I can describe it. I, you know, if, if we're going to go into the org chart and structure chart, you need to do a second episode with my partner, Sean, because I candidly do not understand half the stuff he tells me. Okay. So, but I think that generally gives us a sense. So uh, there is a, a profit distribution that happens throughout. And then when there is an exit of guild down the stream, hopefully it's for a higher multiple than, than the original multiple paid. And they would get a commensurate share of that relative to how much equity they rolled and how big their profitability became as a part of the guild group. Is that right? Yeah. But, but you know, John, what I think is important to call out is you know, when, if there is a liquidity event in the next three, four, five years, it's not necessarily for 100% of everyone's ownership. The beauty that you've seen in some of these HVAC platforms is some of these early platforms that were first movers in the space have traded two, three, four times. And so what I tell every owner, which is 100% true, is if we do end up selling here in the next three to four to five years, uh, I plan to roll as much as I can, even if it's 100%. Because I want a portion of my net worth tied to Guild in the garage door industry for as long as I live. You know, if I have children, if I have family, I want them to have their net worth partially tied to Guild. And that's because I believe so much in what we're building and even more in the underlying industry. I mean, this industry historically has been in the Stone Age as HVAC, as plumbing, as landscaping, as all these classic residential services industries have been lifted up by institutional capital and adopted best practices, digitalization, um, strategic branding, that's all starting to happen now in the garage door industry. And that's the reason it's going to grow 7 to 8% over the next five years versus 3 to 4% for all these other residential services categories. And so I can't think of a better place to park your money than in the kind of single most dominant consolidation vehicle in a category that's set to grow 2x what every other residential service category is. And P.S., that consolidation vehicle has the Mount Rushmore of the industry leading it in the owners that we have running their brands. So I would love to park my money for as long as I can in the guild. You mentioned that the owners are able to get a quarterly distribution based on their profitability. Two questions there. First, a mechanical one. Is that based on cash flow or adjusted EBITDA or EBITDA, the guild group kind of central? Free cash. Board. It's based it's on what? cash flow. Cash flow. Cash flow. Got it. But one and of the things, one of the things to, to know about these businesses and why they're so attractive, especially for a consolidation play, is a lot of the garage door businesses are 95 plus percent free cash flow conversion. So when you think about, okay, what's free cash flow, what's EBITDA, they're pretty damn similar. Because mm, mm. because it's a lot of service, right? Exactly. Got it. Okay. How do you ensure that the founder, especially when they've taken some chips off the table, doesn't take their foot off the gas and just maximize cash flow? Because in my own way, I'm thinking, okay, I'm growing this business, I'm growing this business. And then I have this liquidity event where I take 70% of my wealth and put it in my jeans. All of a sudden, I've got more money than I've ever kind of imagined having. And 
and yet I own 30% of this business, but I, you know, like I, I, my motivation's gone to grow it as much and as aggressively as I had before. And, and whatever motivation I may have left, it might be like, well, we'll just keep taking these cream off the top here and keep this profitability train going, but no kind of incentive to build, to grow, to acquire, to reinvest. Like, how do you manage that? I would, I would imagine be a classic sort of conflict uh, with the cashed out founder and their motivations to grow versus just kind of hive off the cream off the top. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think before we really started this journey, before we had a single company under LOI, let alone a single company closed, I think we had the same concern. We had the same fear. And you don't know until you really experience it, how it's going to turn out. Um, and I think you know there, there are two ways to mitigate that risk. You know, the first, and I know people will scoff at this answer, but it's really true, is be really thoughtful with who you partner with. You know, you can tell a lot about a person in the three to four months it takes to close a deal, in the multiple in-person visits you do, the site visits, uh, the diligence trips. Um, I, I'd like to believe um, that our full team can have a very good assessment of the level of motivation and care of that owner um, historically and what they kind of will act like and, and feel like moving forward. Um, and what I can say about every single owner in Guild is I think every single one is more motivated than they were pre-joining Guild because they know just how powerful this second bite of the apple can be. And I think they all, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, um, and Carrie honestly kind of alluded to this in her podcast, but they all feel so energized now to be a part of a team with other, quote unquote, Mount Rushmore figures in the industry with colleagues that they admire so much and can learn so much from. I think that's part one. Part two, which is more of the, hey, structurally, how do you know you're protected, is that's why we always have people roll. And you might say, hey, but if they're only rolling 15% or 20%, getting 80% up front, do they really see kind of the size of the prize? And because of the multiple expansion, the multiple arbitrage, if the business grows, and we're not talking doubles, business grows five to ten percent a year, you have the potential, even on a twenty percent, twenty five percent minority share, to make two to three x what you made in that upfront liquidity event. And so, I would argue that the motivation moving forward is even greater than the one previously. And when it comes to hey, let's maximize for profits and not invest in long term growth. Um, you know, I can wholeheartedly say no owner thinks that way because, yeah, could you do a couple of nefarious things in the near term over the next six months to use your EBITDA? Of course. But then what does the business look like next year? You know, we're not selling Guild in the next six months. I'm not selling it in the next year or two. And so, you know, yeah, your cash flows from distributions will increase over the next six months. Um, but you will be shooting yourself in the foot for long term sustained growth. Um, How do you plan to, to keep Guild before selling it? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, and I think one, a lot of people want to know the answer to. Um, you know, I, I think that the polished answer is we can't put a timeline on it. Um, we continue to have uh, exponential growth daily. And so we would be crazy to consider any offer in the next year or two. Um, However, um, I think we owe it to all the stakeholders in Guild, from the executive team to the owners, um, to ourselves and, and to our investors, to seriously consider um, any potential partnership proposals and offers. But I, I will say, it, I, I don't foresee us having any sort of liquidity event for at least another two years. What would you say to the skeptical owner who's listening to this in Midtown or, you know, like middle America somewhere sitting on a home service business and, and it's just sitting there saying, this just sounds like a bunch of financial engineering. One rich guy, he's buying these businesses, it's not his money. I, he's I'm actually not rich. I, I don't draw a salary from the business. 
but he's got investors. He's got he raised 35 million bucks. The kid's just 27. Now he's going to roll it and sell it to another private equity group. And all oh, they're just a bunch of stuffed shirts. They're going to roll it onto another private equity group. Like, how about, you know, like, I can imagine some listeners going, ah, oh, this is just a bunch of financial engineering. And it's a bunch of fancy yeah. people who are, are getting rich off our backside. How would you respond to someone like that? You know, I, I would give two responses. The first would be, don't take my word for it. Don't ask me to convince you. Here's the cell phone number of 17 owners. I have not told them that you're going to contact them. Be my guest. Contact all 17. 17 for 17. Text them. Call them. All of them would be happy to speak to you. Speak off the record. None of it will get back to me. And ask them all candidly. Tell us about Jordan Dubin, Sean Slazic, Joe Delaney. Here's my fear. They're just kind of fancy late 20 year olds, financially engineering, they're going to flip this and then run away. Ask any of those 17 owners or all of those 17 owners, owners that have been with us through the closing process, owners that have known us since we didn't have a single company to our name, owners who knew Joe, Jordan, and Sean before they hired some fancy executive team. Um, ask them. Don't take my word for it. Um, ask any of them. So, so that's one. Um, and then two is, I'd love to come meet you. You know, it doesn't need to be over dinner. Uh, I'd love to come visit your shop. We can get coffee, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Um, I can go to your son or daughter's baseball game, soccer game, whatever you want. Um, and after we've had the chance to meet and after we spend time together, you can tell me if I'm a, a fancy guy from New York who doesn't have long-term goals for this business and the partners. Um, but I would ask, you know, keep, keep your judgment and your idea of who I am um, on pause until you've met me in person and until you've spoken to other people who have worked intimately with me and us over the last several months, close to a year now. A lot of our listeners, you know, are, I guess they're a little bit, uh, hesitant in some cases to sign up for rolling equity or an earn out if it's a service business or even 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 vendor financing like loaning money to the the new buyer um, because they 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 don't like the idea of sticking around and they, they kind of you know they're independent spirits and they want to uh, they want a full exit and I get why you ask them to roll and I like I it's a totally it's market, every you know, private equity investment kind of roll up would, would do the same. Do you ever entertain or would you ever entertain um, put options or some guaranteed liquidity for the tranche of equity that they do roll? Is that ever, would, would that ever be something you would agree to or consider or is it, you know, is it totally a non-starter? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it would be something we'd agree to. Luckily, it hasn't come up. Uh, or I shouldn't say luckily, because we'd agree to it. Um, but it, candidly, John hasn't come up. And the reason is, and it goes back to who are the people you're partnering with? You know, get to know their vision, their motivation, their character. Uh, the hardest conversation we have in every single partnership is not valuation. It's roll percentage. Every single person wants to roll 49%. And we say, no, you can't roll 49%. But they want to roll more. They want to roll more. And then you're like, no, you can't roll 49%. And you're like, fine, what about 45? No, you can't roll 45% either. That is, you know, what I, what I love about the people in this category is they believe in this industry so much. They know the growth that's coming. They know the power of their businesses, their teams. And then they why want sell? lower valuations to roll more. But why sell then? If they're so excited about the industry and they're so, and I, I, I get the multiple arbitrage, I get the fact you get a deal on buying uniforms, I get all that. But like, if they think, man, this thing's going to the moon, like, why sell? Because they're self aware. They're self aware and they know. So the industry is large. You know, there are 15,000 independent garage door repair companies, but it's very tight knit at the top. There are about 100 best-in-class garage door companies 
And I would say of that 100, they all know each other, at least on a first name basis. Some of them are like best friends, visit each other's shops, or in Facebook groups together. And they frequently interact with each other in person through IDA events, International Door Association, um, and, and previously through this group called Garage Door Freedom, which was like a networking group. And so they're self-aware to know, hey, I can learn from other owners because I have already learned from other owners. I have already picked their brains, inherited best practices. Imagine how much larger and how much faster the business can grow if I was literally on their team. There wasn't this invisible wall of, hey, we're competitors, even if we're 10 states away, but we're colleagues, we're partners. And so I think you have owners who understand just how much more they can get out of their business in terms of growth and profitability, not even by you know joining Guild and getting the procurement savings and getting the multiple arbitrage and getting access to our executive team, but working alongside other best-in-class owners in the industry, owners they know and, and admire and respect. And so, um, you know, what, I love all the owners, but what, one of the owners that has a, a really special place in my heart is Jeff Sanford. Jeff Sanford was uh, the first deal to close. He was the first one in. And I, I joke with Jeff to this day. Uh, I say, Jeff, what, why the hell did you say yes? Like now it's easy for people to say yes. Sure. Like the writing's on the wall. But, you know, you should, you objectively should not have said yes. It was, you know, three 20 year olds uh, at the time. We knew very little about the industry. And, you know, he tries to give me more credit. And, and I say, no. And, and the real reason is, he saw the writing on the wall. He knew that this thesis was going to be successful more so than we did because he knew the potential in this category. And he knew that if he was the one to start the fire, to start the domino effect, more Mount Rushmore figures would pile in. And, you know, there, there's a... Jeff we have closed today 12 and we have another eight under LOI that should close over the next two to three months. No, sorry. My question was, Jeff, how big a business was his oh, when you acquired it? Quite large. Um, when we acquired it, they were just shy of $15 million of revenue. $15 million. Yeah. He's an, he's an amazing owner and an even better human being. But you know, the expression we use at Guild, which I think Jeff embodies more than anyone, is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And the together part is not Jeff Sanford and Jordan Dubin. It's Jeff Sanford and Jake Wald. Jake Wald and Kerry Kelch. Kerry Kelch and Travis Trentham. It's joining forces with the best owner operators in the industry. I can see why that resonates. For a lot of our listeners, they are uh, tired of being alone. You know, they're the top of their... The entrepreneurial journey is a lonely one. Yeah. Yeah. Now you've got a couple of partners, but for a lot of our listeners, they would be the sole owner and they've been doing it for years. And there are times when it just feels damn lonely. And so the idea of being able to rub shoulders with peers that you respect that has done something similar to you, I can see being incredibly uh, attractive as part of the value proposition of joining the group. So good, good for you, for sure. Walk me through... Uh, what you look for in a company, you mentioned Jeff, but we don't have to use that specific example, but you know, just some broad parameters. What, what, what lights you up in terms of an acquisition? Is it like, uh, you know, a certain minimum threshold in terms of revenue or EBITDA? Uh, what are the kind of investment criteria? And then I'm sure you've got those off the top of your head. I'm just curious though, what are the deal killers? What do you see and you go, yep, no, nope, no, thank you. Not interested. <laughs> so first, what draws you to a potential acquisition? And then what are the things that you're like, no, not, not in a million years? Yeah. So I think, I mean, there, there are so many factors. Uh, if it was only one criteria, our job would be a lot easier. Um, of course, you have the financial metrics. So, you know, we are looking for the uniquely scaled sophisticated operations. And so um, while this may be a small company in the world of HVAC, plumbing, uh, and landscaping, for us, the smallest company we will independently partner with is nowadays $5 million of revenue. Um, $5 million of revenue. $5 million of revenue. When it comes to token acquisitions, so acquisitions where 
we buy smaller businesses for our larger brands like Garage Door Doctor, Jeff Sanford's business, we'll go as low as 400,000 of revenue. So there's, there's no deal we won't consider, but to be kind of a partner company of Guild, these days you have to be above 5 million of revenue. You know, if you're sitting at four and a half million of revenue, you have an amazing business, we're not going to turn away. But we've kind of said, hey, five million uh, is our threshold. We look for at least 15% EBITDA margins. Um, we feel like best in class in this industry is 20 plus percent, you know, between 20 to 22 percent. And so we feel like if you're at maybe even 12, 12 to 15 percent EBITDA margins, you're doing as well as you can based off of your size. And with procurement savings, with economies of scale, with us helping you with your back office functions, there's line of sight to you getting above 20. Um, I'll move away from the financial metrics for a second, but there are plenty more. Um, another big thing is revenue mix. So we are residential focused. So that doesn't mean we won't partner with a business that's 70% residential, 30% commercial. But our stated goal for Guild is that we will never be less than 85% residential. And when we look at the commercial side, it has to be light commercial. So not dock and door, not heavy industrial work, but rather, hey, the storefront on Main Street, the glass doors, the full view glass doors on a Jiffy Lube on the side of the highway. Uh, and the reason we feel comfortable doing that commercial work is one, unlike HVAC, it's not so black and white with residential players and commercial players. But two, the same technician that can do a high-end residential door can do that commercial light work. The same manufacturers that produce the doors for the residential product can also do the full view doors for like light commercial. Where it becomes a completely different ball game is dock and door. And so we stay away from that for now. Sorry, when you say dock and door, is that what you say? Dock and door. So think of a 100,000 square foot Amazon warehouse okay. with like every 20 feet, there's a different truck bay. Yeah, got it. I want to dig in here because because I think a lot of our listeners, and this is something we talk about all the time, it, are tempted to grow their top line revenue because they view top line revenue as their sort of goalpost, their report card at the end of the year. and in chasing top line revenue, it often has them wander off into these one-off jobs, into these one-off areas where it'll juice the top line, but take them off their business model. So let's say, for example, you've got a garage door company, uh, they're doing 5 million in revenue, uh, yet they a million of that comes from doing uh, doors for airplane hangers and Amazon warehouse facilities. Yeah. How, so still 80% res residential, but 20% of these, how would you approach valuing a business like that where effectively the 20% commercial, it, you can't really do much with, like, how would you value that business? Well, the things I would look out for are customer concentration. And that's one of the reasons for the most part you see, and this is a generalization, but a generalization backed up by data. For the most part, commercial services platforms will always trade at a discount to residential services platforms. There are a number of reasons at the top of the list when you have a B2B, B2B relationship versus a direct to consumer relationship. Um, oftentimes you'll have customer concentration, the payment terms are worse, and there are less value creation levers to pull on like the marketing front, for example. So the things I would ask myself about that business is, hey, was this one hanger job that, and hanger jobs could be as much as $400,000 for one project that takes three months. And you know you were lucky that it was a bid process. You, you got that bid work. Um, we don't want to underwrite that. We don't want to expect that to happen next year because chances are it's not. And so you're buying a business with, I think you said, $5 million of revenue um, that likely will be less than four and a half next year. And so those, that would be one thing I look out for. The other thing I would look out for is, hey, do you have kind of this dead weight of technicians that can only do these dock and door jobs? Because if that's the case, you in a year where you don't get the hanger job, 
you have costs hitting the P&L in the form of wages for a technician group that can't help on the main side of the business, which is the residential side. And so that's another thing you've got to look for. Uh, so, you know, there are a bunch of factors. Um, I would say the specific example you gave is, is a rare one because you wouldn't have just a business do like a one or two off hanger door job. Um, I think what more times you'll see is like a 60 40 split. And then you really have to dig into the transaction level data and look at, hey, who are your top 10 customers on the commercial side? Um, you know, it is one 25% of revenue because that scares you. Now, if that top customer that's 25% of revenue is all of the Mavis tires in the Northeast and you're servicing their doors monthly and you have a three year contract, not an issue. But if that top two, three customer is one massive door at the local airport, you start to worry a little bit. Um, I guess I'm curious to know how it, how it impacts your valuation. So let's just go back to my example, $5 million business, 4 million great recurring residential customers and a million from Amazon. Do you apply, do you basically look at the business and say, okay, this is a $4 million acquisition, not a $5 million acquisition? Or do you, yeah. do you apply a some value to the Amazon work or virtually none? It, it depends again on customer concentration. So the Amazon work, if it's your line of sight to kind of three years of a partnership with them, or let's use another example. Let's say four million of revenue residential. A million dollars is several uh, Amazon-like warehouses where you're servicing their doors or even replacing their doors. So no one job is more than ten percent of revenue, um, but it is kind of different from your overall um, business mix and, and what the business stands for. Um, in that case, we'd probably do like a sum of the parts analysis, and we'd say, hey, the Core business, the bread and butter, is a $4 million revenue business that's spitting off, let's say, 500, 600,000 of EBITDA. Um, we think that business should get a four to five times multiple. $1 million of the business that's spitting out 250,000 of EBITDA. It's a solid part of the business that we think won't go to zero. So we're not going to not give it value, but we think it's more three to four times. And so, and then you just add the two and you're like, hey, um, here's what we think the value of the business is. Yeah, I think this is such an important lesson for our listeners because, of course, wandering off away from your core value proposition of serving, in this case, residential customers, has all these hidden concerns. As Jordan points out, you've got to go hire technicians that understand how to do a different kind of job. You've got customer concentration. You might have cash flow issues that gets extended out. And there's all these, this sequence of kind of domino effect that you un inadvertently do. And then at the end of the day, you may not get much value for that one-off job that you did or a discount. So it's, it's a great lesson. And I, I appreciate you going there with me, Jordan. I know our time is short. Are there, is there maybe one other deal killer that you've seen where you, you look at a business and let's keep the subjective stuff out of it. Cause I understand if you kind of saw it like a, a, sure. an owner that was kind of slimy and not, not a, a great value, yeah. fit, you wouldn't, you wouldn't move forward. So maybe an objective thing that you look at, you're just like, no, I'm, I, I'm not going to do that deal. I'll give you, I'll give you two or three quick ones yeah. Um, yeah. and you can decide which one you want to kind of drill into. Um, has to be W2 employees. You know, we don't want a business that's all 1099 subbed out labor. Um, that's not a business. Uh, you know, that's managing a bunch of different subcontractors. Uh, yeah, and so for our, for our listeners that are outside of the United States, what Jordan's referring to is like full-time employees versus yeah. people who are on contract. Uh, so that's a, that's a great tip. So for you, it's got to be full-time. W2. Legitimate full-time workers got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, maybe if there's a specific type of job you do, there's one subcontracted crew that you've used over the last six years, but you know, you'd want it to be less than five percent of revenue. Um, yeah. so that's one. New construction. New construction is a deal killer. You know, our goal for Guild is to always have the platform be sub 10% new construction. Right now, we are sub 10% new construction. And the challenge for us is going to be 
how do we continue to grow, continue to partner with awesome companies while staying below that 10% new construction mark? What is it about new construction you don't want to touch? Payment terms are way worse and it's cyclical. You know, if you go back and you look at the data from 2007, 2008, new housing starts can just drop, drop off a cliff. And so you don't want more than 10% of the revenue of your business being tied to such a cyclical part of the economy. And I know we haven't seen anything like what we saw in 2007, 2008. Um, and this is where partially kind of the reverse engineering and putting yourself in the minds of a future private equity buyer goes is uh, you have to be really careful with your new construction percentage. And, and not all new construction is built the same. You know, track home is the worst. Um, and then custom home can be really profitable and really good. Um, but the unfortunate part about it, and this is where, you know, when you're deciding how to grow the business, it's both an art and a science. You have to be mindful of what's the next buyer going to think about? What are the things that are going to turn them off and deduct two turns on your exit multiple? The same way we just talked about it. Mm -hmm. So I I think it's, you don't want to ever completely reverse engineer the the growth of company, a platform, what have you, but you want to be intentional about how you grow it. And for us, we're committed to always keeping our new construction percentage below 10%. That's super helpful. And I think uh, a good sort of insight into the way you think about acquisitions for sure. Um, I think people are going to want to reach out to you and and learn more about Guild. Uh, What's the best way for folks to find out more about you, the the company? If they've got a home service business, they might want to chat with you about. What's the best way to do that? Uh, LinkedIn, honestly. Um, I I check. LinkedIn religiously. I probably I have one form of social media, which is Instagram. And these days I check my LinkedIn app more than my Instagram app. Um, I, multiple times a day, I check LinkedIn. Um, and in fact, it's, it was pretty awesome. Yesterday, I got a cold message on LinkedIn um, from an owner uh, of a super large company in a different category, so not garage door services, um, saying, Hey, I listened to Carrie Kelsch's podcast. And you sound like an awesome partner. You know, we've been approached by multiple private equity firms, but that's not the route we want to go. We we want to go with kind of you and what you've built. Do you have any interest in launching what you did in Guild with Guild in the garage door industry? In our industry, we'd love to be the first partner. Uh, and so, you know, he came to me via LinkedIn, LinkedIn messaging. So for anybody out there, LinkedIn, follow me. LinkedIn it is. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the uh, the time you've given us today. For folks who haven't listened, uh, please do go listen to Carrie Kelch. After having listened to this interview with Jordan, it'll make it all the more interesting for you to hear Carrie's case and and her wholehearted endorsement of what you're doing. And she's just a huge fan of Guild and 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 the and the kind of family you're building. So, uh, thank you for doing this. We'll put your LinkedIn profile in the show notes at builttocell.com. Jordan, thanks for doing it. Thanks for having me.